was very, very visible down in Miami. Scientists are saying that the 42nd parallel or above is good for climate change for the future. So I've also encouraged my children to think about that when they start setting down roots. Uh, so Juan's a climate refugee before it becomes an issue. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's an issue down in Miami already. It is, it is, but it is. the foresight. Yeah. So, um, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No, so it's just very important to leave the world a better place than we came in. Mm -hmm. and, and renewable energies are here now. There's more jobs in renewable energy in the state of Pennsylvania than there are fossil fuel jobs. 91,000 to 43,000? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's a growing field. Might as well get on board with the future. Yeah, uh, concerning HB 1425 and SB 630, which is 100% renewable by 2050. Uh, you can let Dan know that there were seven constituents from his home area here in support of seeing this uh, SB 630 get passed. Uh, he's obviously very first with solar and what it means for northwest Pennsylvania, western region, central, and eastern as is. Yeah, you know, as Dan knows, we're facing the climate rapidly changing. Erie has the most biodiversity in the whole state. Preservation of that biodiversity obviously means incorporating renewable energy. Um, and then also it means jobs for a lot of individuals inside of the Northwest region, Western region, Central and Eastern region. Yeah. Um, I'm Pat Lupo. I'm with the um, Benedictine Sisters. Um, I teach at our neighborhood art house, so I do a lot of work with kids. And I'm um, involved with a lot of environmental groups. And I think um, we really need Senator Laughlin to come on board um, with this um, particular bill, which has been, which was introduced by a uh, Republican and to try to bring all of his friends along with him so that we can move this agenda forward. I think um, we're doing a lot locally in the community to educate people and bring them to this point, but we need our, our political leaders, leaders also to help us create the political will. Hi, I'm Missy Laurie. I live in Girard, West County, and um, it's my first time here. Um, pleased to meet you, Matt. And uh, remember when Mr. Laughlin, Laughlin was standing by Barnes and Nobles with his with his poster jumping up and down before he got elected yeah. in his car hearts there. So yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I I really would appreciate your support on the bill. I'm right. very concerned about the environment. I'm concerned for my sake, for my children's sake, for my grandchildren, you know, I don't know what sort of bill it's gonna be when they grow up because everything's getting hotter and wetter and Bush fires, the, the wildfire fires are getting worse, and the, the storms are getting more severe. So yeah, I, I, I really think we need to hear that every session there's enough votes to pass it, and it's just being held up by the process, not being brought to the floor. It's going to be that the pressure on that one decision not to bring it out of the committee, not to bring it to. Well, I, I think that people need to pressure that one person. So right. But part board. of the pressure is having everybody else visibly on it. I, it's my opinion. But uh, I, I my, do think my that opinion is that he doesn't give a damn what the other members think, and that is that is that is a matter of fact. But it's more clear. It's even more clear to the voters mm -hmm. where the where the problem is that if you want to get something done, you've got to vote differently. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and how much difference a speaker has how much political influence a speaker has. I don't think that's so evident to, to a lot of people that are, that are just getting involved in, especially in, the, in this climate issue, that this issue is bringing them in for the first time, young folks that we're talking to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to educate them on the process. Um, you know, what I, I think the legislative, legislators need to do a better job at educating the public on the process. Uh, Renewables. We right. eventually need to make that change. It's just a, it's a matter, we, we appreciate it's a matter of when, but I, I'd yeah. like to do it sooner rather than later. Right. We appreciate so, but so the big hang up is we have to make sure that the people who are going to be impacted by this, they have employment opportunities after. You know, I don't know if any of you have been to Green County, but that's, I mean, that, that's sort of the, the mecca for uh, 
natural gas development, coal. Um, that's, that's the only jobs out there. Those are the only type of employment opportunities out there. What are those people going to do in, in, in Representative Snyder's 50th district? They're going to lose their houses, not going to feed their families. We have to, I mean, it's those sort of things we have to think about. Too. Yeah, that's, that's, what, and that's the purpose of the, the transition committees that are mentioned in the bill, mm -hmm. is to, um, you know, before, that, before we move from one to the other, that there are somebody who's working on the jobs that you can have issues for the folks that are involved in this. And I agree, but you have to think of the anxiety yeah. for some families. That there's a potential that they might not be able to um, grasp a new type of trade to find gainful employment or, or pick up on it as quickly as they, they can operate in a rig or, or whatever the case may be. And those are other factors to consider too. So when I make my decisions, I like to I, I try to look at the entire picture. And, and obviously the planet comes first and foremost, but we can't forget about the actual people here too. But don't the numbers show that there are more jobs in renewables now than there are in coal, and there's increasing numbers in not the renewable Not in Pennsylvania. Energy? There's not, there's not the fact in, in Pennsylvania? Uh, not that I've, not anything that I've seen. Mm -hmm. We are among leaders in natural gas production, um, so I, I would challenge the renewable numbers on that, because uh, we do quite a bit of natural gas production. We are struggling, and when I say we, I'm talking about communities, neighborhoods, towns, cities, states, nations, humanity, to make these decisions as quickly as possible to weigh environmental issues, jobs, economy, health, and put them all into our decision making and really understand how these decisions are best to be done to solve multiple problems, whether they're economic, environmental. And, and one thing is true, is that decisions we make today really aren't just economic decisions, and they aren't just environmental decisions, and they aren't just job-related decisions. They are a combination of all of them. But I don't think that it is fair to a lot of the leaders and community members because they've not been given the tools and the training to make these really complicated decisions uh, to date. One of the challenges we are doing in school systems across the country is to build much more skill and understand when you're looking at a forest, what are, what's its value? How do we manage that for health issues, economic issues, environmental issues, all at the same time? and take a longer view on any one decision as opposed to just a short-term economic benefit. And having a scientific basis for those decisions and really draw in as many expertise that we can get and really understand the full ramifications and the long-term ramifications of any one decision is something that is very challenging for us to do right now. But I think that we're looking at better tools and better resources and better approaches every day. So anytime we're looking at one decision, you must have more aspects of that decision uh, than we historically brought in into that decision point. I think it's a critical thing that all of us are struggling with. And how we do that is going to be whether we have a thriving economies and communities that are resilient and 
great places to grow up and raise children and have clean air, or we're gonna not prioritize that. And as a result, we're gonna have decreasing ecosystems and decreasing uh, quality of life, and that's our choice. When you're talking about long range choices that we have to take into consideration, and I've learned this from my work in Paris, that young people, whether they're youth or children or young adults, they have a say in this too. And what I've been encouraged by in working with them is that they want to be at the table as an equal. And they want to be considered much more actively in why a decision is being taken than historically I've experienced. So they're, they're bold, they're clear, they're organized, and they are politely demanding a seat at the table. And they don't want to be at the kids' table, but I think it is important when we're talking about long-range decisions that they are heard, they are invited, they are respected, uh, because they have perhaps the most to, to look at because they're, they're going to be with us the longest. And uh, what I've, I've seen in a variety of instances across the country and even internationally is that when youth, young people, young adults, young professionals, children are brought into these decisions, adults change the way they think and they change the decisions as a result. And I think I would encourage any community to really bring young voices, young leaders, young uh, members of our community into the process so that we keep our, our focus on the long view. Because these are long issues, they took a long time to get here, and they are going to take a long time for them to be solved. So uh, the sooner we start bringing them to the table, I think the better our decisions are going to be for a long time.